This morning, you and I are invited to join two of Jesus' disciples as they head to this village called Emmaus. It's a confusing, it's a disconcerting, and it's even a dangerous time. Jesus has been brutally tortured and killed for his preaching and his perceived rabble-rousing. It must certainly not have been the safest time to dra travel about as a disciple of Jesus. And on top of that, there is a very credible rumor circulating that Jesus has, in fact, been resurrected. He's come back to life. And we presume that this is what these two disciples are talking about when, in the midst of this confusion, comes the risen Christ. We hear that at first he goes unrecognized, but then he reveals himself to these disciples at dinner, at the breaking of the bread, which is why we have so many Eucharistically themed hymnody here this morning. These disciples can't believe that they didn't recognize him. We're not our hearts burning, they said. We're not they burning within us while... He was talking with us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us. And then these two, they tracked down the other 11 disciples and they told him what they'd seen. It was clear that they were all amazed. They were all awakened by this encounter. And then as they talked about it, they became enthused and energized by their friends who, who came to them and, uh, and, and, and also declared the same thing, that Jesus was alive. And then they became taken with a divine fervor, a drive to go out into their chaotic world and to bring Jesus' message to all who would hear them. They were not to remain scared and confused and hopeless. Remember, it says their heads were down and they were feeling sad. No, they were to go forward in confidence that God was present and working to bring about wholeness and reconciliation and peace into the world. They had come to the conclusion that they were to go, they had been chosen, that this was their time. As you and I also reach a conclusion that this is our time. As a retired bishop from Alaska recently put it, he said, now is the time for which our faith has prepared us. Now is the moment when all that we believe can be put to work. Now we can turn to the inner resources that we have been developing over these many, many years to face the challenge of a world in desperate need. We are not afraid of this crisis, for we have been made ready for it. We are not cowering in anxiety, bowing to the threats of the unknown, for we have devoted our lives to the belief that something greater than fear and disease guides human history. We have studied and prayed and grown in the Spirit, and now we have come to the call to use what we believe. My brothers and sisters, we know our people need hope, confidence, courage, and compassion, the very things for which you and I have been trained. We are the calm in the midst of a storm. We see the sunlight shining through the clouds. We sense the hope reverberate, reverberating through airwaves of worry and anxiety. We have been taught and prepared and equipped, for we are being called and encouraged and sent. So stand your ground and let your light so shine that others may see it and find their faith as well. An emergency room doctor in the Bronx has been living in a hotel room for the last three months, talking nightly to her husband and three children by video chat. And last night, uh, and one night last week, after she had hung up the youngest child, she's an eight-year-old girl, she became tearful. She turned to her father and she asked, how much longer will mommy have to stay away from us? I miss her so badly. Why can't she just quit her job and come home? Well, her father took her little face in his hands and he wiped away her tears and, and he said this. He said, your mommy loves you and me and this family more than anybody in the world. And she is so happy that ye, we have warm food and we have a safe home to stay in. But mommy has gifts that God gave her for people who are suffering very badly. And right now there are a lot of sick people who are depending on mommy. And while she would want nothing more than to come home and to hold you in her arms and to read to you your favorite bedtime stories, she knows that in times like this, we must all do our part to help those who are hurting. Well, then daddy asked the little girl, what can I do? Her father told her, well, you can do what your mom does and think about those around you who are hurting and how you might help them. 
The little girl paused for a moment and then she threw her little arms around her father's neck and she said, Daddy, I know it must be really hard for you to be without mommy right now. So I'm gonna hug you just as hard as mommy does. And I'm gonna tell you that I love you just like mommy does. At dinner with the disciples, you and I heard that Jesus takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, he gives it to the disciples. These four motions, take, bless, break, and give. God has taken each one of us as God's own. At our birth, God created each one of us with our own unique DNA, put us in families and space and in time that's unlike anyone else's, developing in us gifts that nobody else has, embedding in us a network of relationships that are, that are utterly irreplicable, and all of us, all of this for the high and lofty purposes known only and ultimately by our Creator. And God gave us Jesus to show us who God really is and to do the work of dying for the sake of love, so to empower you and me to do the same. God has taken each one of us as God's own. Take, bless, break, give. God has blessed each one of us as God's blessed ones. The heart beating to power us 100,000 times a day. The mind working to inform us, processing and reasoning more powerfully than any supercomputer 100 times its size. The air we breathe, 20,000 breaths a day of which we pay little or no attention. My brothers and sisters, we are fed and clothed and housed and loved in ways which during the course of our lifetimes may have been truly regal. For God is our king and we are king's kids. When we think about it, then there's the blessing of knowing Jesus as well and embedding those promises in our hearts. You know Jesus' promises that we are loved and cared for and strengthened and, and have a place prepared for us to be with God, to be with love forever. God has blessed each one of us as God's blessed ones. Take, bless, break. For God has indeed broken all of us as well, often with our own consent at our own hands. For to say, I love you, is a recipe for both joy and pain. For in our most intimate relationships come pinnacles of joy and unbounded fulfillment, yet also the possibility or reality of heart-wrenching pain and soul-stabbing suffering. To bear a child, to love a child, to raise a child is to one day let that child go and to feel our hearts so filled with love be one day deeply pained by an absence. To build a home, rented or owned, to paint and carpet and tile and furnish with tables and chairs and beds and lamps and paintings, to love a home that must one day be left behind. Take, bless, and break. They all find their fulfillment in the fourth motion, which is to give. God created us in God's image, didn't, didn't God do that? And that is to, to give. To give life, we give love, we give money, we give time, and how often are the givers blessed even more than the receivers? We look at how we've been taken, who we are, what our uniques, unique gifts are, God's direction and plan for our lives. We look at how we've been blessed, the connections, the possessions, the relationships, the intellect we've been given, what we've been able to accomplish, what we've acquired, and who we have met along the way. When we look at the ways we've been broken, how we've been enabled to give when it's hard, to listen when we'd rather talk, to love when it hurts, taking good note of how the light has found a way to shine through the cracks. We are taken and blessed and broken so that we might give. Friends, on yet another Sunday when we cannot celebrate Eucharist like we want to, we are called to be Eucharist for those who need us to. For now is our time to shine. Let us give to support an emergency food pantry that's feeding hundreds of hungry and weary, weary souls at 16200 West 12 Mile Road. Let us work to support the making and distribution of masks that are keeping people safe and secure, hundreds and hundreds of them. Let us reach out to support our next door neighbors with whom we share a parking lot at St. Anne's Mead Rest Home, who go to work in fear yet might find some solace in the free lunch that you all with your generosity are providing. Let us support one another with phone calls and letters and emails and texts. Let us spread the Easter message of hope and courage and assurance, not simply within the church, but beyond. 
as we go through our Rolodexes, physically and mentally, as we go out into the world as those early disciples did, as our people's window back at church asks us to do, to go ye out into the world, and as our hearts lead us. My brothers and sisters, if not us, who? If not here, where? If not now, when? Now is the time to be creative. Now is the time. All our preparation and listening and learning, now is the time to let it loose. Now is the time to be thinking and planning and praying and plotting for the spread of the gospel in these chaotic times. How are we being called to place our worries in God's hands, to step out in faith, to reach beyond ourselves, and to walk as Jesus walked, heal as Jesus healed, encourage as Jesus encouraged, and bring hope as Jesus brought home. No more dress rehearsal, practice time's over, for now is our time to shine. So let our light shine that others may see it and find their faith as well. Amen.